You are listening to the Terroir Podcast on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome to the Terroir Podcast. I am Caroline Connor, otherwise known as Wine Dine Caroline. I run Leon Wine Tastings here in Leon, the culinary capital of France. And I am joined here by my compatriot, Emily Monaco. <laughs> oh, yes. That's me. I'm a compatriot. I love that word. I'm Emily Monaco. I am a journalist and a tour guide based here in Paris, France, which is not the culinary capital of France, but it is where I specialize in all things culinary and all things driven by terroir. So the very topic of this podcast, which we have said again and again and again, is basically this idea that we have in France that the foods and the drinks that we produce are linked to the region they come from. And that means everything from the soil to the climate, to the people, to the monks, to the legends, to everything. So it's inextricable regionality of delicious things. We are always having a lot of monks. And it is it is funny. I have to, you know, big up Lyon because it's so much less popular than Paris. <laughs> so that's why I'm entitled to that. Unfairly so. I love Lyon. I know. It's the greatest. But it's also like a, a little baby compared to Paris. So... In this episode, we're going to go into Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a really big subject and, you know, we could do a whole season just on World War II in Bordeaux. So that's not going to happen today, but we're going to talk about what Bordeaux is. We're going to talk a little bit about the history and Emily's going to share with us some of the wonderful foods. And I'm so excited about this um, episode because... I do a lot of food tours here in Paris. People are constantly asking me about Bordeaux. And, you know, I know um, a lot of my wine knowledge comes from me deciding what I like and what I don't like and trying very hard to describe it to people who know more than I do about wine. So I am very excited to get into the nitty gritty of Bordeaux with you, Caroline. Awesome. Well, let's get going because it's a big one. Bordeaux is the most important wine region in France, and honestly, is probably the most important in the whole world. The name of the game here is Reds. 90% of the wine is red. It is Cabernet Merlot blends. So all the wine here is going to be Cab Merlot, and then there are other grapes too. Those grapes that you're going to find in a red Bordeaux blend are Malbec, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc. Carmenere used to be a part of that blend, although I don't think there's really any left. Uh, it's all in Chile now. And it's always going to be all about blending. There is white wine here. There is really good white wine. I really love white Bordeaux. There is uh, sweet wines, the world's most famous sweet wines, Sauternes. There is rosé. And there actually is a Cremant. There are bubbles made here. I've never had a Cremant from Bordeaux. I don't think it's a big thing there, but it does exist. Yeah. And I love, so I love white Bordeaux too, but Cremant, tell me about that word, because I think that that's not just any old bubble, right? No. So we'll talk about Cremant more when we go to some other regions that are known for producing it. But Cremant is basically baby champagne. It's made in a traditional method like champagne. It has a, a lesser aging time and it actually you know, will come from somewhere that's not champagne because, again, champagne is a protected place. So there's Cremant all over France. And um, Bordeaux is not a significant producer of it. I've literally seen it once at a trade fair. I've never tasted it. Okay. So most of what we're looking at here is, as you said, reds and that blend of all of those grapes that when we see in California, like a Bordeaux blend, that's what they're talking about is these specific varieties of grapes. Really, we're talking about Cabin Merlot. Cabin Merlot. Got it. The extra grapes like Malbec, Cab Franc, and Petit Verdot, they're, they're in much smaller quantities. So we're talking about Cab and Merlot, and they are blended. This is just a huge part of what they do. So this region accounts for more than a quarter of all AOC wine by volume. It's by far the biggest region. 2020, they produced 587 million bottles, which was actually 10% less than the 10-year average. There is so much wine here that this entire sort of market structure has been built up uh, that requires middlemen. So there are brokers who actually mediate pricing between the chateau and the merchants. And um, that that is a really sort of specific role. And right now there's between sort of 70 and 80 of them. There are 300 négociants. Okay. So what's, so I've heard that word before, négociants, or I've heard like the French, they're always, they're always abbreviating stuff. So like négos. And is that, I, I get this sense that like there's, they, they almost get looked down upon in certain regions, but I don't know what that's about in, in Bordeaux. Like, are they so widespread that nobody cares or is it like a thing? Like, what is that? So a négociant is a company that buys grapes from growers 
They can also buy wine and then they will finish it. They will bottle it and they will label it and they will sell it. So a negotiant is a company that is outsourcing the grape growing generally. It's, it's, there's a lot of ways to be a negociant and a lot of negociants also do have their own vineyards. So there is nothing stopping a negociant from being high quality and negociants are very good. And in Bordeaux, there are excellent, excellent high-end negociants as there are everywhere. So there's nothing wrong with a negoce. A negoce is awesome. It's just a different way of structuring your business. And it, it does mean you can actually have higher volumes. So a lot of independent producers that might have, you know, a few hectares might also decide to get a license to be negociant so they can produce more wine, they can buy grapes, and they or they can even buy wine, blend it, bottle it, package it, and and have basically more volume. So it's not a bad thing at all. Okay, cool. Um, and there are, yeah, there are 300 negos in Bordeaux. There are a thousand wineries at least, but it's dominated by a few. So this is the thing. There are a lot of wineries, there are a lot of grape growers, but there are some huge properties. And most vineyards in France are pretty small. Most vineyards, you know, are a handful of hectares. A hectare is like a little more than two acres, I think. So they're, they're pretty little generally in France, but these are big vineyard areas for the most part in Bordeaux. Uh, the city of Bordeaux, as we talked about last week, it lies on the Gironde Estuary, which goes into the Garon and the Dordogne Rivers. So it is this big port city, which we will talk about again and again and why it's so important. I'm going to just talk a little bit right now about the sort of regions and and the, the terroir in that sense. Right, because Bordeaux is broken into like, it's you got like Bordeaux, the city, and then Bordeaux, the region. And within Bordeaux, the region, you've got lots and lots of like little bits, right? There is a lot going on here and it okay. is confusing. So the most important thing you need to understand is the difference between the left bank and the right bank. So the left bank is to the left of the estuary and that is a gravel soil that we'll talk about more that actually I think is really interesting, was only really developed in the 1600s. This is where we're really dominated by Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon. And this is where the most famous wines come from. Most of the most famous wines. There's a couple on the right bank, but most of the really top, super expensive chateau are here. And we have from top to bottom, north to south, we have the Medoc. Then we have the Haute Medoc, which tends to be higher quality. Then we have these really well-known villages, saint Estef, Poyac, Saint-Julien, and Margot. There are also Lisrec Medoc and Mouly, but they're not as uh, well-known. And then beneath Margot, we have a little more Haute Medoc. And then beneath that, we have the city of Bordeaux. The region of Pessac Leonia wraps around Bordeaux. And it's also really known for very good whites. Then beneath Pessac Leonia, we have Grave, which is also whites and reds. And then beneath that, we have Barsac and Sauterne, which are sweet whites that we'll talk about next week when we talk about our luxury episode. Whew. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. I think that I would like to have like a, a map or a, at least a dish towel with all of my Bordeaux villages listed in order so I can memorize them from top to bottom. But that's very helpful. You can definitely do that. Well, you can definitely include a map in the show notes because I think it is really helpful. Yes. Okay, cool. So that's the left bank. The thing you need to understand about the left bank wines is that these are the Cabernet based ones. So they're likely to be at least 70 or 80% Cab. They're going to have uh, a lot of tannins. Cab has a really black fruit, like cassis, and, and a green note. So something very green peppery. Uh, pyrazines is the, the compound that, that creates that aroma. And so these are very complex, very ageable. And, you know, the really fine ones are going to be very expensive. There also are cheaper ones that, that are going to be more approachable and aren't going to be quite as rich um, that are very good too. So that's a left bank. And then the right bank is actually on the right side of the estuary, and it's north of the Dordogne River, which actually runs pretty horizontally now. The right bank is where the Merlot is, and the two most famous appellations there are Saint-Emilion, which we will talk about a lot in this episode, and then Pomerol. Saint-Emilion is this big limestone outcrop, and then Pomerol has a lot of clay. These are both areas with a ton of ageability, really wonderful fancy wines, and they are actually more historical in a lot of ways than the left bank. The right bank also, in the sort of north part, includes the Blay and Bourg, Côte de Blay, Côte de Bourg. These are, is a bigger kind of area that's like little sort of patchy bits. This has some really, really good value, but it's also inconsistent at this point. They haven't quite nailed their marketing. They haven't quite nailed consistent quality, but there is some really good value in Blay and Bourg. 
And again, on the right bank, we're talking about Merlot. And so Merlot based blends in this case, they're going to be really 70, 80, even 90 or hundred percent Merlot from uh, sometimes Merlot gives you a suppleness. There's something richer, I think broader in your mouth. It has a little more alcohol. So it's a little bit, it's not sweeter. Sweet is an objective measurable thing, but it, it has a roundness that the cabs, I think, have more sort of angles. The Merlot is more round. It has like plush, soft tannins, more of a plummy vibe. I really like Merlot a lot. I'm a big fan of right bank. I actually prefer the right bank to the left bank. Um, It's more my style. Then in between the right and the left bank, we have an area called Entre Deux Mers because it's in between the two rivers. This is where most of the white comes from. So this is where the most of the white is. These are white blends that are Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon mixed uh, with perhaps some Muscadel. And they tend to be really aromatic. They're really peachy. I love white Bordeaux and it's really not very popular. So it tends to be pretty good value. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of white Bordeaux. And specifically, I choose it a lot if I'm doing a very varied cheese plate because it does have that really nice, like you said, like the peachiness. There's sometimes some like Great fruitiness to it, and it can uh, scare people a lot less than when you say the word Chardonnay in front of Americans. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. It's often the good stuff is going to be oaked, and I I love it. I think it's so interesting. The best ones do come from like Pessac, Pessac Lyonnais, and Grave, mm-hmm. um, but Entre Deux Mers they have some good stuff in there. So, okay, this those are like those are the appellations. But the issue with Bordeaux is that on top of our appellations, we have other classifications. And there's a lot of drama about these classifications and they are contentious to say the least. Have you heard anything about the classifications in Bordeaux? So I haven't, but the idea that there would be contention behind the classifications just strikes me as so very French and I am here for the drama. What oh what is what is this drama, please? Oh my god, there's so much of it. So Okay. <laughs> first of all, Let's discuss the difference between the AOCs, which are a classification, and the Bordeaux classification system. So for our intents and purposes, these are two separate things right now. Bordeaux does have 57 AOCs. Holy shit. It's just unacceptable. But that is within these other classification systems. So there's six different classification systems in Bordeaux. Woo! And when I say classification system as opposed to the AOC, I'm talking about an actual classification for the domain itself. Okay, right. Because the AOC is like a regionality thing that we see, we've seen in other episodes with like our cheeses and our wines. And it's basically like a bunch of producers getting together and saying, this is the region that we are in. These are the grapes that we traditionally use. And if you want to be in our club, you have to follow our rules. Like that's basically, it's a treehouse club, right? For wine. It's also about the like physical boundary on the map right and you do have and you have to follow the rules but like if you're in that boundary and you're following the rules you can you can have it the bordeaux classification isn't like that it's about specific chateau okay so if you've been classified and you buy grapes from a you know from somewhere else like obviously you still have to follow the aoc rules but you still keep your classification so the classification here is related to the domain itself Okay. And related, I guess, to quality, which AOC isn't. AOC is like, you you can be a rule follower in the AOC and make shitty wine. Yeah, but- But you can't be classified and be and make shitty wine or you can? No, no, you definitely can't. I mean, I think if you're, if you're classified in the AOC, your wine shouldn't be that shitty, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, like they, your quality has to be good enough to be, you still have to like submit for mm, okay. classification for the AOC still, but it is, it's a different system. Because, yeah, this is really assigning a quality tier to the chateaus in Borno. Okay, okay, got it, cool. Now, if you guys know me at all, you know that I'm a little woo-woo. I'm a little woo-woo up in here. So if you're a little woo-woo too, you need to make sure to check out Annette Deleu's podcast, The Heart of You, on the Paris Underground Radio. Annette goes into everything spiritual, and it's been just a blast listening to season one. Can't wait for season two. Now it's time for a word from the sponsors of the podcast. And now, back to the Terroir Podcast. So six different classification systems are um, Cru Bourgeois. So that's in the Medoc. This one 
is also like tons of drama. It was like a thing in the 1800s and then it was and then it was and 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 people sued over it and this and that and then now it is. So cru bourgeois is basically people that weren't classified in 1855 in the Medoc and Grave classification, which we'll talk about next week, who think that they deserve something. And that is currently in place. So you can see cru bourgeois on a label and it means that the wine should be very good. Next, we have the Cru Artisan. So this one is newer, a much newer uh, classification. And it's about the size of your vineyard. It has to be small and about whether or not you are actually doing the farming yourself. And so there's a lot of like foreign ownership in Bordeaux. And so I think this one is kind of a way to give the middle finger to all the Chinese owned uh, Chateau. Um, <laughs> although I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Then we have the 1955 classification of saint million And this one is very contentious. It is reevaluated every decade, but in 2012, they, they there were issues with it in the early 2000s. People were really unhappy with their classification. So they got sued. So in 2012, they like made it completely objective, i.e. they they had the judges come from, I think, Champagne and Burgundy. And so like they didn't even involve Bordeaux people in the judging, but they also included a bunch of stuff about marketing and press. So actually the two of the very top tier Chateau, Cheval Blanc and Chateau Osson dropped out of the classification. They're like, no, we don't agree with this. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so that was a really, really big deal. So in saint we have Grand Cru Classé versus Grand Cru. So there are, there's Premier Grand Cru Classé A, which is, which was Cheval Blanc, Osson and Chateau Pavie, I think. And then we had Premier Grand Cru Classé B, which is a bunch of others, including Chateau Belair Monange, which we will talk about later. And then we have this word Grand Cru. So Grand Cru is actually AOC and refers to specific vineyard areas, whereas Grand Cru Classé refers to the chateau itself. Just to keep things simple. Then we had a classification of the Grave Chateau in 1959. And then the big one that we're going to talk about a lot next week is this 1855 classification of the Medoc and Grave and the Sauternes and Barsac. So in 1855, we had this huge classification of the Chateau and the top five Chateau are the ones that are still the top five today. And that has not been revised. So it's it's pretty interesting. We will talk a lot more about that next week because <laughs> it's, it's a big one. Whew. So is that clear for you now? Or do you feel like pulling your brain out of your ears? I mean... I want to drink it all. Um, no, I think, um, I think, yeah, no, it's pretty clear. It's just, it just seems like the, it's, it's classic France, right? It's like, how can we make things simpler? I know, let's make them super complicated. It's a lot. I mean, I think it does, in some historical ways, it makes sense for the right bank and the left bank to feel separate. Sure. So can I teach you a little bit about the history here? Oh my God, please do. Because you know me, I'm a big old history nerd. And I'm sure that in with Bordeaux being as big and important as it is, that must have some, you know, historical precedent of some kind. I mean, so much. Well, we talked last week about a lot of it, about, you know, it's a port city, about the uh, Hundred Years' War. But basically... You know, the Romans were here first, as with everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they were growing grapes in, in the Daldone and then up in saint Emilion as well. Nobody was super interested until the port, at, like in, ter in terms of export, until the port at La Rochelle opened in the 12th century. And then medieval Europe is like, fuck yes. Oh, you know, we have this idea of medieval Europe as being like the quote unquote dark ages. Like, hell no. There was a ton of trade. There was money. People were having a great time. They wanted their wine. England and the, the the northern countries, they needed wine. So at this point, the wine is grown in Blay and Borg on the right bank, in, in the Daldon, in Grave. The right bank was where it was at at this point. And um, <laughs> the left bank was actually just like a marsh. Like it wasn't, it was too wet. You couldn't grow grapes until these Dutch traders in the, the 16th century or the 17th century, sorry, the 1600s, they, uh, they drained it to, to grow more wine. The Dutch know what to do with a marsh. Yeah. They just drain the shit out They're of it. Excellent at marshes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They are. That's funny. <laughs> but it really became famous. Like we talked about last week because of the English when Eleanor of Aquitaine married uh, Henry of Plantagenet, who then becomes the King of England, acquires these territories and they have this port. And so Bordeaux was always really important in the English court in medieval times. English people still call it claret, which is kind of funny. It was granted an exemption from the um, Grande Coutume export tax. So it was cheaper and it was just highly favored in London. Even after the Hundred Years' War, the taste for Bordeaux was there. It was in. 
it was never really about monks like like it is elsewhere. It was always about business. So, you know, this was not a place that, I mean, obviously there were monks and stuff, but it was not a place that was about monks. It was about business. And and most of the wine probably was not that great, even especially from the left bank before the invention of bottles and corks. They, uh, they probably wouldn't have been aged that long. So it's, it's really interesting. It was, it was really volume. It was about volume. Yeah. And I hear you on the monks, but I do have to say, my the the Catholic schoolgirl me in me needs to tell you that there were actually nuns in this area. Nuns, nuns okay. specifically nuns. I usually am all about the monks, but in this particular instance, I'm all about the nuns because they invented one of my absolute favorite pastries because it's not too sweet, and I'm not into pastries that are overly sweet, which is called the cannelle. Oh, I love cannelle. Cannelles, right? They're so good. They're local to Bordeaux, and they, I mean, I think like most things that you find in Bordeaux, are indeed linked to the wine industry, but there's nothing actually whiny about this particular cake. So basically, you have this order of nuns in Bordeaux called the Annonciade. And I guess basically, you use egg whites as part of the wine. Okay, you're gonna have to get you're gonna have to get all sciencey on me with this. But it's it's part of the like the filtration system for wine. Is that right? Egg whites? Okay, so today, we would use an egg white product called albumin for this. But Basically, back in the day, and still some people do this, you add egg whites to cloudy wine to like pull out the gunk and then you take it out again. So it's actually called fining. Okay. When you fine, you add an ingredient and then it binds with the cloudiness and then it you pull it out again. So a filter is like a physical passing through of a sieve, right? And a lot of wines are filtered as well. But fining is sort of an extra step uh, to clarify the wine. And yeah, in, in Bordeaux back in the day, they would use a ton of egg whites. Right. And if you need that many egg whites, you have all these yolks left over. And so often you have, I mean, I love the invention stories like this of like, what do we do with this garbage? I know. (laughs) Give it to the nuns. And what do the nuns do? They start baking it into these amazing, super like dense, eggy, rich cakes that like, if you have never tried a cannelle before, it's essentially crepe batter that's then baked in a little like, uh, like a little cylinder that's like maybe three inches high and two inches wide and in these like super crazy copper molds. They're so pretty. That are greased with with beeswax, right? Yeah. So they they are greased with beeswax and they're like, they come out and they should come out like dark brown, almost black. Yeah, like almost burned. Yeah. And then they often like brush them in rum and they're super delicious. And so like with these actual copper molds, like you want them to be handed down like like your grandma's cast iron skillet you want your grandma's cannelle molds like you want the ones that have been used for generations and generations because then your cakes just pop right out and so the nuns had invent- invented this cake which is delicious and then we start moving away from using egg white so albumin as a fining agent and you're starting to use i think uh starts kinds of clay in bordeaux instead well, I think these days people use people use a lot of different things. You still could use albumin, but you're not. I mean, if you're going to be making wine, you're not going to be like cracking eggs these days, right? But people use uh, icing glass, which is from fish. They use uh, gelatin products. They use bentonite clay if we're being vegan. So a lot of wine is not vegan because of this reason. It gets removed again, but it is used in the process. Okay. So yeah, so you have, so you had all these egg whites that were being used. You had all these leftover egg yolks. Then we suddenly don't have all the leftover egg whites, but people still have a demand for these cakes. And so then we think that that's sort of how this specific macaron was invented in saint Emilion, which is using all those egg whites that we now no longer need for wine making, but we now have because we're making the cannelais that became popular <laughs> because we were using the trash. It's a, it's a snake eating its tail. I love it. And now we have another delicious cake, which is like a little almond flour based cookie that's so light and delicate that they basically sell it still stuck to baking paper. So you buy like a sheet of these and you can peel them off the paper and eat them, which always makes me think of candy buttons, but I'm just an American and uncouth. Well, that is a great opportunity to segue into talking a little bit about Saint-Emilion. So Saint-Emilion really was where the finest wines were coming from. On the right bank, I still think they do. And they, there's this like limestone plateau. There's, have you ever been there, Emily? I have. It's so, it's like walking into a freaking fairy tale. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's a, it's a sort of little hill. You know, it was a really, it's not like a mountainous region, but so sentiment is like village, medieval village perched on a hill. It's so beautiful. And it actually has 
a really interesting story. This is a place that I spent some time because I helped out with the harvest and was an au pair for the Moex family who own Chateau de Belair Monange among some other chateaus. And I have my friend Kelly on here to tell us a little bit about the crazy history of uh, Saint-Emilion basically being made of Swiss cheese. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, uh, Caroline, for having me. My name is Kelly Mouex. I'm American, but I'm married to uh, Frenchman Edouard Mouex, who's the third uh, generation in his family business uh, called Etablissement Jean-Pierre Mouex, which is a wine merchant and uh, wine production, a vineyard owning family on the right bank of Bordeaux. Most of our vineyards are in Saint-Emilion and Pomerol. Edouard and I live on one of the family vineyards, which is in Saint-Emilion, called Chateau Belair Monange. We live there with our two children, a nine-year-old son and a seven-year-old daughter, who you know very well, Caroline. I do. Well, I helped take care of the nine-year-old, Pierre-Henri, when he was a very little baby. So I was lucky enough to get to crash with you guys for a couple months, and it was pretty sweet. (laughs) So you know about all the charms and the glories of Saint-Emilion. We love living here. And um, I'm really happy to be working part-time for the company Jean-Pierre Mouex, mostly on the marketing and communication side. And also a bit over a year ago, I launched my own small business, a French lifestyle brand celebrating the beauty and the simple pleasures of uh, life in the wine country, French wine country. And uh, our first product is a luxurious leather tote bag with a quite interesting design in the inside, all in neoprene in order to carry wine and other precious liquid cargo. It's named to Maison Mahan, which is one of the buildings on, on our property in Saint-Emilion that has this beautiful view over the Dordogne Valley and the Saint-Emilion region, which is so rich and full of amazing and sometimes quirky history. And today I wanted to talk to you about the flip side of Saint-Emilion, its secret underground life. Around the 8th century, Saint-Emilion was settled by a monk who came from Brittany, Saint-Emilion, and he, he came there on a religious pilgrimage and brought a lot of reputation to the town and the surrounding area. It grew from there. There were many churches, cathedrals, monasteries in the town of Saint-Emilion. And a lot of this development came from the building of these buildings that came from the stone of Saint-Emilion itself. In the 12th century, Saint-Emilion built a monolithic church, which basically means an underground cathedral. It's one of two monolithic cathedrals in Europe. So what does this mean? They basically extracted about 15,000 cubic meters of stone (laughs) in order to create this underground space. And they used that stone to build other buildings around and on top of Saint-Emilion. The main extraction period was happening more like in the 18th and 19th centuries. Obviously, as there was more money and more desire for big buildings, an industrial revolution coming along, and Saint-Emilion offered a very easy way for the stone to leave because it was just kind of ushered and then taken down the the Gahon River. And Mm -hmm. so building a lot of towns around in the area, of course, Saint-Emilion, Libourne, and then some of the stone was traveling as far as, as Bordeaux and perhaps even a little beyond there. There was a lot of stone being extracted from there, creating this kind of Swiss cheese underneath Saint-Emilion. The Swiss cheese effect is what I'm so curious about because I know when I was living with you guys that you were undertaking an enormous project to resuscitate some vineyards that had been unusable because they were unstable. Yes. Because they were collapsing into the the quarry, right? Exactly. Yeah, because as this huge push continued in the 18th, 19th century for more and more stone, obviously they weren't breaking the stone from the top of the earth because we wanted to leave the the vineyards intact. Today there's something like five levels um, underground. It's about 200 hectares of underground quarries. And all of that was pretty well policed and regulated throughout time. There were rules about how much you could take. However, obviously, you know, push comes to shove and people started breaking those rules and over extracting. As people needed more and more stone and were a bit too lazy to go way back to the deepest, furthest, lowest part of the quarries, they started hacking off at the edge of the pillars. And that's what created the weak points and the vineyards in peril of collapse in order to maintain the integrity of the vineyards 
and the integrity of the buildings, reinforcement was entirely necessary. But it's a, such a big project that most people can't really do it, right? And it's all in prime real estate too. Of course, the largest concentration of quarries are under the main hill of Santamilio, the main part where the town is and where most of the premier Grand Cru Class A vineyards are. Why are they there? Because that's the best real estate, because it's the highest, because it has the natural drainage, because it has the concentration of stone underneath it. So that's the largest mm -hmm. concentration of quarries underneath. Bel Air Monange happens to be the highest vineyard on the limestone plateau, and we therefore have the largest concentration of underground quarries and inherited with our, our purchase of Bel Air in 2008, the lion's share of the work. Other vineyards and other parts of the town have had to consolidate and reinforce their quarries, but most other areas don't have such a huge concentration of quarries as we do at Bel Air Monange. So how do you deal with this? What do you do? When we purchased Bel Air in, in 2008, we started immediately sort of attacking renovation of, of the property above ground, underground, all around. With the main focus being the reinforcement of our quarries, we turned to experts to help us make studies. There's a fantastic man called Mr. Lost, ironically, who uh, was a specialist in the quarries and helped us map the quarries, understand the weak points, to do a whole study. And... Then you can attack the problem in several different ways. You can create sort of giant underground structures to reinforce almost like a scaffolding. However, for the very long term, and we are really focusing on the long term investment, the best is really to recreate more pillars underground to help recreate the balance. And so that's basically what we did. We, on five different levels, created these underground pillars, which basically consists of putting up walls and then filling it with coulis, which is concentration of sand, water, and bentonite, which basically creates a cement-like structure. And again, we're not talking about filling up the entire quarries. And we did what, five years of consolidation, and that represented basically two times the size of Notre Dame de Paris. That's incredible. I think it's something that people have never heard about. I remember you guys were right in the middle of that project. It was 2012 that, that I was with you. And Edward was saying how he, as a kid, was exploring mm. those tunnels. And I'm just like, no, thank you. <laughs> that sounds horrifying. <laughs> It's absolutely monumental. And of course, we had plenty of sleepless nights wondering what in the heck we were doing. But when you have terroir and heritage, we felt like morally we had no choice. I mean, making holes and like pouring money down, down the holes essentially is not really something people want to engage in. But we believe in, in the terroir and the potential of this place that is is totally unique and special. And since it is a family-owned business and hopefully will go on for many generations, we opted for the, the full Monty approach. <laughs> that is, it's so cool and so interesting. So thank you so much for sharing that with us, Kelly. Absolutely my pleasure. Thanks, Caroline. If you're enjoying this episode of the Terror Podcast, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Paris, A State of Mind where each week, Marie and Gail tell you all about the ins and outs of renting apartments in Paris. The Terroir Podcast will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to the Terroir Podcast. Wow, Kelly, that was so interesting. And I mean, it is really cool to see that here, as opposed to pretty much every other region we've talked about so far on the podcast, it really is not about monks, it's about business. It's about business. So back to the 14th century, most French wine in England is from Bordeaux and a quarter of Bordeaux's exports went to England. In the mid 17th century, this is when the Dutch merchants, the 1600s, they're now kind of running the show. They drain the marshes in the Medoc, allowing for grape growing. So all of these, um, these chateaux on the left bank that are very opulent and very beautiful they're not real lived in castles like the kind or ones that were used for fortifications, like the kind we are seeing in the Dordogne we were talking about last week. These are these huge castles, but they're kind of fake. They're like one room deep. <laughs> really funny. Like I remember going there and I'm like, Oh my God, it's so beautiful. And you like walk around the edge and it's like, wait, there's nothing there. <laughs> like it's just a, it's just a facade. Um, but they're awesome. Disney castles. <laughs> yeah, they really are. They're total Disney castles, but they're, they're beautiful. So 
you know, England and France are pretty much at war during the 18th century constantly. Bordeaux is being smuggled to England. After the French Revolution, there's a new class of wealthy bourgeois in Bordeaux who have the means to maintain the vineyards and wealthy English people are still lapping it up. The trade in Bordeaux was really dominated by British and German merchants at this point. So this is in the sort of 1800s and the 1855 classification happens during this really big boom. Again, we're going to talk about that next week when we talk about our luxury products, but it really got hit hard in the later half of the 1800s by phylloxera. So we'll talk about phylloxera again and again, but phylloxera is a great pandemic that eats the vines and kills everything. And they were like bringing in grapes from Algeria, bringing in wine from Algeria and selling it as Bordeaux. Then we had World War I, which was difficult on everyone. And a lot of chateaus changed hands at that time, uh, probably because a lot of people died. The Russian market disappeared overnight with, you know, the the start of the Soviet Union. And the Russian market had been pretty important. You know, all of the courts were were in, drinking this stuff too, the good stuff. And then prohibition killed the US market. So like right after World War II, we have this like big kind of, you know, double whammy of misery of phylloxera, well, triple whammy, phylloxera, World War II, and just like a bunch of markets disappearing. And then, you know, right after World War II, we have World War th- or World War One, we have World War II. Yeah, hang on. We haven't hit World War Three yet. It's coming, but it hasn't arrived yet, Caroline. Please don't say that. It's not. It's not. It's not. Don't reveal don't our say. don't reveal us as time travelers from don't say that. not too not it's too not. far in the distant future. It's not coming. Okay. But Bordeaux is, it's a really interesting period for Bordeaux during World War II. So Bordeaux was actually occupied by the Nazis who took over the, cha- the sh- like big chateau. You know, they sent the men away to prison camps. Uh, a lot of the, the high profile people in Bordeaux were Jews, including the Rothschild family, who, um, who owned some of the finest estates on the left bank. And there was a lot of like resistance in terms of just little things like people really, you know, hiding, hiding in cellars and things like that. But I think the region really suffered a lot and it was bombed by the allies. Let's remember again that Bordeaux was a very attractive port, a really important military significance, a very attractive port. And also that had a lot of German merchants. So business kept going uh, during the war, which is interesting. But I do want to ask you, Emily, because I think Americans sometimes don't really realize the extent of this, uh, what the difference in France between occupied and free was because that line went right through Bordeaux. Right. And that's really interesting too, if you kind of look at the way that the rest of France was divided. So let me dial this back for a second, because basically France was divided beginning in 1940. Right at the beginning of the war. Yes. So right at the beginning of the war, essentially France technically goes to war eight months before it fights in the and loses the battle for France at the Battle of Dunkirk, which if you saw that movie, you know what it is. But basically, France officially had to enter the war when Hitler invaded Poland, because that meant that Hitler was breaking the non-aggression pact with Stalin. He basically forces Britain and France to declare war. And Britain and France had been kind of resisting this and like looking up in the sky and pretending that nothing was happening further to the east because we just come out of World War One. And they were like, how long can we pretend that Hitler isn't quietly invading all of the former uh, Germanophone countries and we're just going to pretend it's not happening? But we were technically allied with Poland. So as soon as the pact was broken, we had to ally with Stalin and technically enter into the war. But we didn't really do anything of particular note until the Battle of Dunkirk, we were kind of thinking defensively, but end up falling quite quickly to, uh, to Germany. And Charles de Gaulle basically says France has lost a a battle, but France has not lost the war. But we, this is where all of those stereotypes of the French being people who wave white flags around come from, is basically that we fought one battle, we lost it terribly because we weren't prepared for the Germans to go around our Maginot defensive line and come in through this natural border we have with Belgium. And instead of defending the country, the government decides that we're going to give the Germans something. And the something that we're going to give them is basically the entire northern half of France. So, I mean, it is worth remembering and i think this is something that you don't really feel until you're here you go to any village in this country and there is a world war one monument that lists 10 men with the same last name yep you know 15 times like all the men were gone yeah they all died and so these were people that had not built up enough men and and also you know who who had suffered so greatly during world war one so I don't love that stereotype, especially coming from Americans who didn't experience it 
in you know in the same way that the French did because they really suffered incredible losses in World War One. Yeah, this was a war being fought in our backyard by, and I say our, I'm saying from a French perspective, it was being fought in the French backyard by French men. People were dying left, right, and center, and we're really only looking at 20 years hence, you know, it's not been that long. No, I mean, it's it's still in such recent memory, so. Huge. And so, I mean, at this point, we do basically decide to capitulate to a certain extent to the German presence. And the decision that's made is to, well, we're going to move the French government, basically. We're going to give the Germans the northern half of France, and that includes Paris, which is the capital. There's discussion of possibly moving the seat of government to the French territories in North Africa, colonization. But uh, the vice premier, Maréchal Pétain, who was a World War I hero, insisted that the government had to remain in France. And so basically, they decided to move the capital away from Paris to this town of Vichy, which is in central France, kind of like right in the middle of the country. They picked Vichy because it was a huge destination for the rich and uh, wealthy because they had the thermal baths there. Yeah. <laughs> and so there were more phone lines there than anywhere else outside of Paris, like that you could go there and still have be connected to the rest of the world. So they moved their government there. Everything north of this line that's drawn right above Vichy goes to Germany and everything south of it remains ostensibly free. Of course, that's not necessarily going to mean that much, A, because we're still going to be collaborating with Germany in the south, B, because we are not going to have a lot of free passage between north and south. So you have to have like a passport to go from free France to occupied France and vice versa. So like Lyon was was technically quote unquote free. Right. Right. Like Leon's free and, and, and it's a horrible stain on the city of this history. I mean, because quote unquote free meant that, that you were collaborating. I mean, they were, they were, you know, hand in hand with the Germans. So exactly. A lot of dark shit went down. Definitely a lot of dark shit. Everybody, <laughs> the second that the war was won for France, everybody was like, oh yeah, I was in the resistance. I was in the resistance. 2% of the adult French population was actually in the resistance. So it's a lot of people looking the other way while a lot of really shitty shit is happening. Yeah. But, well, for our intents and purposes, what's interesting is that they wanted Bordeaux. And so this line went, like, right through Bordeaux. Right. So that's that is, that's sort of this interesting thing of this is that when you look at a map, and we'll put one in the show notes so that you can see, it basically goes straight through France in, like, a horizontal line and, and cutting some stuff weirdly. Like, there's a castle in the Loire Valley that has one foot on either side of the Cher River. Uh, called Chenonceau. That castle is half in free France, half in occupied France. So you actually, people would use it to smuggle art out of occupied France and into free France. That's funny. So they're being very rule follow to a certain extent of like, no, this castle is half in free, half in occupied. And then you get to Bordeaux and you'll literally see the line just drops off because they want the city of Bordeaux. They want the port. They want the waterfront. And so all of that, the wine industry. And they want, they want the wine. <laughs> They want the wine. They want the money. They want the wine and they want the port. So all of that remains, even though it's in the geographical south of the country, it remains part of the northern occupied part of France. And what's what's interesting also, there was there's a story, there's a fantastic book if you're interested in um, in World War One and World War Two and the wine industry in France called Wine and War by Don and Petey Cladstrip. And in this, they tell a story that, that apparently the end of the war Hitler gave the order to blow up Bordeaux, the city, which is a beautiful ancient city. And the general who had been occupying the town was like, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> so that's good. But basically, Bordeaux was very involved in World War II. There's a, there's a lot you can learn about it. I really enjoyed an article from Jane Anson, who is a Bordeaux expert. We'll link to that in the show notes. But most of the wine during this time was, was awful. It was terrible. Uh, there were a bunch of bad years. And they couldn't make Bordeaux mixture, which is... Um, a copper mixture, copper sulfite that you spray on the grapes to basically protect from certain pests and diseases. And it was interesting. The, I mean, the wine was awful throughout this time until 1945, which had like an amazing weather and, and was, is still one of the 20th century's great vintages. So, you know, we could, we could talk about this forever, but uh, one fun fact that I think is cool is Centimillion has this monolithic cathedral that Kelly told us about. 
And it actually, right at the beginning of the war, became a secret storage unit where the French, you know, smuggled over 50,000 square meters of priceless stained glass windows from, you know, cathedrals and, and other treasures of French art in, uh, and then st- stashed it in that underground cathedral. So. Oh my God. That's, that's so cool. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can talk about it forever, but uh, I do want to talk about today's fine wine market and what you need to know about Bordeaux right now. But I think that is best saved for next week for our luxury episode. If you're enjoying this episode of the Terroir Podcast, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Romancing in Paris. This podcast delves into everything you need to know about the city of love. The Terroir Podcast will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. So I, I think, I feel like I've gleaned a lot of information in terms of the history of this. I also now kind of know, like, if I'm a cab drinker versus a Merlot drinker back home, like, obviously in France, you do see a lot of blending, but if you want one of those things to be kind of at the front of your mouth, now I know which ones to buy. So that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Well, what about Bordeaux cuisine then? Because I mean, I, I let you talk a little bit about cake, but... <laughs> I mean, I think so much of Bordeaux cuisine is really all about the wine, right? It's like so often I think that you are picking a wine that goes with your food. And I think the French are really proud of their ability for the most part to like pair food and wine pretty effortlessly, like without being too much of a dick about it. Like they'll they'll come up with a pairing that works really well. And I think Bordeaux is one city where you do see people picking a bottle of wine and then picking something that is nice to eat along with it. So I I do think you see a lot of really innate simplicity in the cuisine of Bordeaux. One thing um, you see a lot is things in a red wine sauce. So Mm -hmm. we talked um, a little bit, I think, in our Normandy episode about how a la Normande, usually if you see on a menu something a la Normande, it's going to mean either in a cream sauce or served with apples. In Bordeaux, when you see a la Bordelaise, it means in a red wine sauce. So you'll see this really awful looking dish called l'empois à la Bordelaise. So it's made with lamprey, which is the ugliest fish in the entire world. And when I say the ugliest fish in the entire world, I mean, it's uglier than monkfish, which is already just like a sea devil with so many razor sharp needle teeth. Yeah, those are hideous. Yeah. Wait, how can it be uglier than a monkfish? So I'm I'm going to um, quote Wikipedia on this, which I recognize you're not supposed to do, but it's just the, it's, it's, it's a, it's a jawless ancient fish with a toothed, funnel-like, sucking mouth. Oh, like dune worms. Dune worms. It's like an eel with no jaw. It's awful. It looks like a like a toothy worm. And they cook it in a red wine sauce. And so that's something that you can have. You can also have the much less, like, awful oeuf en murette, which is a poached egg in a red wine sauce. I feel like that's not a Bordeaux thing. That's a burgundy thing. Excuse me. That's a burgundy thing. Okay. Well, excuse me. I'm so glad that you corrected me. I love being corrected. It's true. I bet you do. I do. I like, I like learning things. I like, there's a French expression, je me coucherai moins bête. I'll go to bed less stupid. I love that. So anytime you learn something new and exciting, you just go to bed less stupid. Je me coucherai moins bête. Moins bête. Moins bête. I like that. But I think that the probably the most approachable of the a la Bordelaise dishes would be like a steak with Ooh. a red wine sauce. Yeah, I can do that. How about we how about for this week's recipe I put together a little steak and red wine sauce? Ooh. Can we can we have it with some of Kelly's wine? Uh I'm gonna have to ask her, but I think that could be on the agenda. Oh, oh man, I'm in luck if it is. <laughs> Am I invited? You are definitely invited. I'm psyched. It's really, really, really good. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. In Lyon, it's illegal to drink Bordeaux because we only drink Rhone, Beaujolais, and Burgundy in Lyon. Like you go to a Lyon restaurant and they don't have Bordeaux anywhere. So that's wild. I don't drink nearly enough Bordeaux <laughs> because it's just like not. I mean, it's, it's just, I'm becoming French. I'm like, I only drink Beaujolais. <laughs> so it's funny though. I do really enjoy it. And I, I need to go back and visit. It's been a minute since I've been and it's such a cool place. So I, you know, I know this was brief and we did not devote as much time as we um, could have. I mean, we really could, I, I could talk about Bordeaux forever and there are so many people that have devoted their lives to it. So it's a, it's a pretty incredible region. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited for next week when you delve into some of the more luxury Bordeaux, because Bordeaux, aside from being a huge wine region, is also one of the, I mean, home to some of the most expensive wines 
in France, the most luxurious ones. Yeah. I mean, the market is, is wild. And, you know, it, it's interesting. The wine that we talked about, about Saint-Emilion, Chateau belle Monange, that is one of the world fine wines for sure. So there is, there is a range, but you can get good value in Bordeaux too. And I'm not going to say this isn't good value. It's amazing, but it is also expensive. But there are some price. There are some prices in Bordeaux that will um, give you heartburn. Well, can you can you give us a little bit of um, a, a taster of like how 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 big are we talking in terms of price tag? Oh, thousands for a bottle. Thousands. Oh my god. Three thousand, five thousand for a bottle. Well, I can't wait to tune in next week to hear. Well, it's not to tune in. I'll be sitting here listening to you extol me on the virtues of the all the luxurious Bordelais wines, which we can then, you know. We're also going to talk about truffles and foie gras. So it's going to be a pretty cool episode. I, I need to figure out what I'm going to cook for that. And uh, who's paying for that? Uh, Seriously. Are we going to get all dressed up? Should we wear tiaras and pearls to talk about luxurious wine? Yes. Luxurious foie gras? I love that. All right, listeners, tune in next week with your pearls and tiaras and pour yourself a glass of the finest Bordeaux you can find and listen to us talk about foie gras, truffles. And wine we'll never be able to afford. (laughs) No, we will one day. Look, if you are listening, follow me. I'm at Wine Dine Caroline on Instagram. Follow Emily. She's at Emily underscore in underscore France, the OG Emily in in Paris. That's me. And that's you. And make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast and tell your France-loving friends about it. Thanks a lot. Cheers. This episode of The Terroir Podcast was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.